When I think of Rome, the first thing that comes to my mind is the Pope in the Vatican City, which by the way we explored yesterday, and I have to say it was really amazing. But I also think of the old ancient buildings from the Roman Empire back then, when Rome pretty much ruled the world. And the ancient building that's really significant for me, at least here in Rome, is the Colosseum, which is where we're heading right now. Time to go to the Colosseum. The Colosseum is about a 20 minute walk from our hotel. We could take the bus, which would be quicker, but since we saw how the bus works yesterday, we decided to walk instead. I like it better that way anyway. I get to feel and see the parts of the city you would normally miss if you were in a bus or in some kind of vehicle. Anyway, since most of the restaurants are closed this early in the morning, I think it was close to 8 o'clock, we decided to skip breakfast and head straight to the Colosseum, which we booked a tour that starts at 10. You know what, most likely we're going to miss breakfast completely today because after the Colosseum, our tour continues on to the Palatine Hill and the Roman Forum. Alright, that's the Colosseum right there. We have to go on that side. Let's see how we're gonna go down to the Colosseum. The Colosseum, also known as the Flavian Amphitheater, is the largest amphitheater of the Roman Empire. You know what, I think it's the largest ever built in the world. Well, this was built in the 70 to 80 AD under the Emperor Vespasian. As you can see, some of the parts of the Colosseum is gone, but if you see this in its whole entirety, it's about 157 feet high, 615 feet long, 510 feet wide with a perimeter of 1,788 feet. We have to find our tickets. Um, I think it's way down there. We actually bought our tickets online already. What I meant was that we needed to find where we could claim them. I think we have to go far to get a proper view on this. Oh man. Anyway, the Colosseum is one of the most famous structures in the world. It was used to entertain audiences with plays, reenactments of famous battles, executions, animal hunts, and most popular of them all is the gladiatorial contests, where gladiators and skilled warriors would brutally fight each other to death. It's estimated that 80,000 spectators are able to watch these events during that time and now it's one of the most popular tourist attractions in the world with a record of 7.4 million visitors just in 2008. So here's what it looks like inside the Colosseum. Now we're just gonna explore the place. So the first thing we're gonna go is level 2. We're gonna go up to level 2 the Colosseum. If you plan to come here, I suggest you buy your tickets online because it really helps to avoid the long lines, which could take more than an hour. Anyway, we got the regular tickets, which pretty much gives us access to this level and the first level only. We could have gotten the guided tour tickets, which takes you to more spots like the platform you see down there and the tunnels underneath. Well, finding a seat here as a spectator back then was a little complicated. I found out that there are levels to the seating arrangement and it's based on social ranking. There are special boxes or box seats at the north and south ends of the Colosseum. It was reserved for the Emperor which of course had the best view of the arena. Well right around the box level was a platform for the senatorial class or the senators. Some by the way had their names carved on the stone seats. Then right above the senators are the noble class and above them are for the ordinary Roman citizens which were divided into two sections, the wealthy and the poor. I'm not sure if our tickets allow us to get to that platform. Maybe there's a way to get there on the first level, but we decided to go around this level first so I could get a better angle of the underground tunnels in the middle. The underground tunnels is obviously below the main arena. The arena, by the way, was about 272 feet by 157 feet of wooden floor, and it's all covered with sand. The tunnels under the arena wasn't part of the original structure, but was added later by the Emperor Domitian. Its purpose was to hold the gladiators and animals before the contest began. You know the construction and design must have been pretty amazing, because I've read that it had 80 vertical shafts for instant access of the gladiators and the animals. If you're wondering, the animals they had here were lions, bears, tigers, crocodiles, hippos, boars, and elephants. Probably where the Emperor sat right there. You can still see the marble seats. The Colosseum, if I read it correctly, saw four centuries or 400 years of active use. Aside from its many performances and reenactments, 
More than 400,000 people and 1 million animals died in this arena, and it's all for the sole purpose of entertainment. I guess if you think about it, this place could have possibly been the birthplace of our sports entertainment today, only not as brutal as what took place here. Anyway, as the Roman Empire struggled and the gradual change of people's desire for entertainment, the Colosseum ended in the 6th century AD. Soon after, it suffered some major damage due to earthquakes and lightnings, causing it to be abandoned completely. Eventually, parts of the Colosseum was used to build cathedrals, palaces, and defense fortifications. Plans to save the arena started in the 18th century, but by the 20th century, nearly two-thirds of the original Colosseum was gone, and only in the 1990s, restoration efforts started and has continued to this very day. So this is the seats, the original seats of the Colosseum. Let me get up here, get a proper view here. Wow. Marble. A lot of people farted on this one, huh? Yeah, let me touch it. Why is there a hole? They have like a engraving on it too. Yeah, it has a senator's name. Really? After exploring the second level, we headed to the first level, hoping we could get access to that platform in the main arena. That metal cross right there was to commemorate the Christians who were thought to have died or been killed here. It's basically a reminder of the suffering of the early Christians in Rome. So that's the platform I was talking about. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get to it because we don't have that tour. You have to pay more to get through, to get, to get down there. So, doesn't matter. There's a whole bunch of rocks anyway. Like I said, it didn't matter if we couldn't go there. The view from this level is good enough. It's probably all marble before, huh? It's probably all marble. Park. <laughs> Center port. Just exited the Colosseum. And now we're gonna go to the Palantin Palan Palantine Hill. I guess that's how we pronounce it. But that's the Arc of Constantine right there. The Arch of Constantine is as you can see, is right in the middle of the Colosseum and the Palantine Hill on the background. It's the largest Roman triumphal arch, built in 315 AD with the purpose to commemorate Constantine I, who was a Roman emperor at that time. The arch is decorated with reliefs or sculptures taken from older monuments which gave this arch a dynamic and stylistic look. I'm not going into detail about the meanings of the sculptures or decorations on this arch, but I have to mention it inspired a lot of famous monuments around the world, such as the Brandenburg Gate in Prussia, the Arch de Triomphe in France, the Marble Arch in London, and many more. The location of the arch used to be the route taken by the emperors back then when they entered the city in triumph. The procession would march along the Via Sacra all the way to the Roman Forum, which will follow as we head to the Palatine Hill. I can only imagine how amazing the scene would have been, and then seeing the Colosseum along the way must have been amazing. So right behind me is the street. It's called the Via Sacra. This used to be the main street of ancient Rome, from the Capitoline Hill, it goes through the Forum all the way to the Colosseum. As I mentioned, this route was taken for the Roman Triumph. If you're wondering, the Roman Triumph was a public ceremony celebrating the success of a military commander who led the Roman Empire to victory. Anyway, this road used to be lined up with colonnades or columns on each side. And not only it was used for the Roman Triumph, it was also used for many historical events, like religious festivals, funeral processions of emperors, and the not so important affairs such as the common assembling of people, chatting, throwing dice, doing business, and surprisingly prostitution. Despite having tickets already, I thought we didn't need to be in line, but we still had to, just for the security check. First thing out of the gate is this arc. I have no idea why I kept saying arc, but this arch is called the Arch of Titus. 
It's situated here before you enter the Roman Forum and the Palatine Hill. This arch commemorates the Emperor Titus and his military success during the Siege of Jerusalem. It was built in 82 AD. It's called Arco de Tito. I guess that's what the name of the Ark is. Yeah. As you can see, it's full of reliefs that depicts Titus's victories, as well as treasures taken from the Temple of Jerusalem. It also has other subjects with its own meanings, but this arch was also used as a model for many arches all over the world. Before we headed to the Palatine Hill, we went around above the Via Sacra just to have a last good look at the Colosseum. I'm not sure if I'll ever come back here again, but seeing the Colosseum in person is really something. Though there's only one thing I can't figure out, is that how come there isn't any restaurants or cafes around here? It would have been nice to have breakfast after our tour inside, since we haven't had anything to eat yet. This is our last view of the Colosseum. We're gonna go that way. So after saying our goodbyes to the Colosseum, we made our way to the Palatin Hill. I have to admit it's kind of hard to know where you really are if you don't have a tour guide because everything here is basically just remains of old structures. It's a good thing they have signs, but you really need to spend some time reading all of them. But it's like little bits of ruins here and there. The Palatin Hill is the most ancient part of the city. It's located here at the center of all seven hills of Rome, and it's about 63 acres of land. Excavation findings show that Rome pretty much began its origins here. They found evidence that people lived in this area since the 10th century BC. And during the time of Augustus, who was the first emperor of Rome, he decided to build his palace here, and from there it gradually became the domain of succeeding emperors. After some time, wealthy citizens occupied and built their homes here as well. These structures or ruins you see here are most likely their homes. After following the path and all these people, we came to this spot on the hill that overlooks the Roman Forum. The Roman Forum as you see here is basically a plaza where you'll find several important ancient government buildings. Obviously it's in ruins now, but in the past, this forum was the life of the city. They had processions, elections, gladiatorial matches, criminal trials, and was a venue for public speeches. Anyway, you'll find many of the oldest structures of the ancient city here, as well as shrines, temples, and former royal residence. As I figure out where we should start exploring first, I noticed majority of people here didn't have a tour guide. You really didn't need to unless you really wanted to know each site. And finding your way around this place wasn't that hard anyway. So as we went down to the forum, I spotted this area. Some kind of like a cave of some sort. It is a cave. It's not really a cave. It's more like a shrine. This is called the Theater of the Great Fountain. I couldn't find any information about this, but all I know is that it's here at the Palatine Hill. And as we walked in, they had set up some kind of light show or visual effects projecting on the walls. And also what looks like a natural fountain sits right in the center. So as we walked out of the fountain, we finally headed to the Roman Forum. We decided to just follow and walk through the Via Sacra, starting from this structure called Portitio Medievale. I don't know what it is and I'm sure I'm pronouncing it wrong. All I know is the name. But right next to it is this. This is the Temple of Romulus. It was built in the 4th century, dedicated to Romulus, who was the son of the Emperor Maxentius. I've read that the main building may have been a library before it became a church in 527. And I think this bronze door leading to the building is not in use anymore. This is the Temple of Antonius and Faustina. It's right next to the Temple of Romulus and was also made into a church. This temple was built in 141 AD by Emperor Antonius himself, and he dedicated this temple to his wife Faustina. It was only after Antonius died when they rededicated this temple for both of them. So this is the Roman Forum. I don't know. It says it's the Roman Forum. See, I didn't know it at that time, but this whole place is the Roman Forum. It must have been really busy here back then. I could just imagine a lot of people walking around here and going about their business. And like I talked about earlier, this place was the center of Rome's day-to-day -day life back then. But our next destination, we're gonna go that way, somewhere there. This is the Emperor Forums. It's basically a complex that consists of the Forum of Caesar, 
Augustus, Nerva, Vespasian, and Trajan. After walking around the forums, we found ourselves here, the Capitol Square, which you'll find the municipality of Rome. This piazza is located here at the Capitol Hill, and the buildings here were designed and remodeled by Michelangelo in the 16th century. And right in the center of it all is the bronze statue of Marcus Aurelius. We walked up here hoping to find a place to eat, but there are no restaurants here at all. You know, normally plazas are littered with restaurants and cafes. Well, this one didn't have any. So we headed down here to the monument of Vittorio Emanuele II. It's located here at the Venice Square. You know, we're hoping to find a place to eat because at this point, I was really getting hungry. But since we're already here, we decided to check out the monument. This monument is dedicated to Victor Emmanuel II, who was the first king of Italy. It sits between the Venice Square and the Capitol Hill. You know, this monument is the biggest I've ever seen so far. It actually looks like a palace or some kind of government building. It stands about 230 feet and 443 feet wide. It was designed by Giuseppe Zacconi and was completed in 1935. The monument features a fountain, sculptures, stairways, columns, and a statue of King Emmanuel. The monument holds a great national significance and is regarded as a national symbol of Italy. But we're not gonna go up there. I don't think you can go up there anyway. I don't know. Since we decided to go up, we came to this area located right in the middle of the monument. Of course, I didn't know what it was at that time, but this is the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. It has an eternal flame built under that statue and two soldiers guarding it. The story about this tomb is that in 1921, during World War I, there were 11 unknown soldiers who died and only one was selected and placed here. I'm not really sure if this is as far as people can go, but as I was scanning to find a way to go up, this happened. <laughs> okay, now we're really gonna find a restaurant to eat because I'm getting really hungry. And we're gonna find a restaurant somewhere here. Hopefully we can find one. This is where we're gonna, we're gonna have lunch. This restaurant, I can't even see the name. But I'm gonna focus on the menu. Yep, that's the restaurant we're gonna eat at right now. Okay, I'm gonna get the all amatriciana. So she's getting that one. Mine, I took the rigatoni. And she got the. So this will be our first meal today since we skipped breakfast. I guess if you plan to tour the Colosseum as well as the Palatine Hill, make sure to bring some food because you won't find any restaurants close by. Anyway, I got myself this. This is called Alla Matresana, also known as Salsa Alla Matresana, and I got it with rigatoni pasta. Well, Amatresana is a traditional Italian pasta sauce that's made with cured pork cheek, tomatoes, onions, and pecorino cheese. It originated from the town of Amatris in the late 18th century and became famous here in Rome in the late 19th century. Eventually, it became a classic Roman cuisine and is considered as one of the best Italian pasta sauce in the world. Right here, I'm gonna try and pronounce it the spaghetti all'aglio, olio e peperoncino. Of all the pastas, she had to get the one with the longest name. Anyway, this is a traditional pasta dish from Naples. It's made with garlic, either sliced, minced, or pressed in olive oil. And it also comes with red chili flakes with a garnish of parsley and parmesan or pecorino cheese. Although this one might not have any cheese, because according to the old traditional recipe, cheese was not added. And then of course the pasta margarita. 
It's said that this pizza was created in 1889 and named after Margarita of Savoy, who was once the queen of Italy, but a pizza from Naples with the same ingredients already existed. Anyway, it doesn't really matter who and when this pizza was created. All I know is that it's one of my favorite pizzas ever. It's very simple. The pizza is made of tomatoes, mozzarella, and basil. Although this one didn't have any basil, but I'm pretty sure it's still gonna be good. There we go. I'm gonna try this. This is not mine. But, oh man, there's like olive oil underneath this. It's like oil. Yeah, it's like olive oil. Mmm. You can really taste the olive oil. I think this will be good with like a lot of Parmesan cheese. A lot. But there's no meat or anything. It's just by itself. It's like very simple, but it's good. They got thorn. I'm gonna try without um, Parmesan cheese first. Yeah. Mine has like some meat in there, some ham, and some cheese. Oh. It has a lot of like, tomato flavor. You know the noodles I noticed? They're firm, huh? All the noodles here are firm. This is the deal here. Oh shit. I don't want you I can't have enough Parmesan cheese. simple. It's like olive oil, some parsley, that's it. But there's, a, there's supposed to be garlic in there. Yeah, I didn't taste the garlic but it's very simple. And that's like a good meal, like a simple dish. And it's like olive oil underneath. Mine is very like flavorful. Very flavorful. I'm gonna go for the um, margarita pizza. And it's, so, it's like sliced so thin. Look at that. It's like really thin slice. Just the way I like it. Looks like it's handmade too. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. The cheese, man. It's the cheese. Yeah, it's like the mozzarella cheese is so good, man. And um, one thing I noticed is that they're um tomatoes. They're tomato. Yeah, it's, it's fresh. So good. The crust is not as crunchy as the other one that we have, but there's still a crunch in there. I don't know if I was just hungry, but to this day, I still remember the taste of the food here, which means it was really that good. One thing that we really like to do is put some uh, olive oil and some balsamic vinegar so that we can dip um, the bread. So good. Yep, that's how you do it. <laughs> Our next stop is uh, this place. This is the Palazzo Colonna. It's one of the largest and oldest private palaces in Rome. It's also a museum where you'll see amazing collections of art as well as rooms decorated with frescoes. Unfortunately, it was closed because I just found out that this was only open on Saturdays from 9 to 1 p.m. Our day is pretty much over. 
So we're just gonna just pretty much just enjoy Rome, I guess. So we didn't have anything planned after this. And just like I said, we took our time and aimlessly walked around the streets of Rome. Just looking at architectures and watching people go about their business, we pretty much just took in the city. As we were walking, we accidentally ended up back here at the Trevi Fountain. Even though we already visited this fountain a few days ago, it was still amazing to see it again. You know, I don't think you'll ever see this place without people. So anyway, while we were here, we spotted this place, which was just right next to the fountain. We noticed that they were selling gelato. Fountain of Trevi. We're gonna have some ice cream right here. Huh? Got myself my own strawberry and mango. What is this called? Gelato. Gelato. There we go. And then this is the coolest part of it all is that we got it right outside the Trevi Fountain. Yeah. <laughs> so good. We ended up hanging around the fountain for a while, then decided to walk back to our hotel. You know, come to think of it, Ever since we started this trip in London, then Madrid, and now here in Rome, this was the first time we actually had nothing to do. We completed our itinerary for the day, and I have to admit, it felt really good to accomplish it. You would think now, since we finished our touristy things to do for the day, we'll finally do some partying. Well, we didn't. We ended up back at the hotel and simply crashed. I know it's lame, but after sleeping a couple of hours or so, it's time to have dinner. So after we rested in our hotel we decided to have dinner again at that same restaurant it's becoming a go-to now because the price is just right it's not expensive and the food is really good so we'll try another menu or we try another dish and see if um, it's still good this is the place And we also ordered this one. So this is called frittura mista or fried seafood. Well on the menu it said mixed fried fish but it's just not fish. On this plate there's some shrimp, squid and of course fish. Now I'm not really sure when or where this dish came from but I'm assuming it originated from a town off the coast of the Mediterranean. Well I read the calamari or squid which is an Italian dish originated in the Mediterranean so most likely this fried seafood plate came from there. With this plate, we also ordered this. This is called spaghetti alla vongole. It's spaghetti with clams. It also didn't say where this dish originated, but it's very popular throughout this country. The clams used on this dish are carpet shell clams or any small clams. There are two ways to prepare this dish. One is with olive oil, garlic, parsley, and white wine. And the other way is the same ingredients, just add tomatoes and basil. Clearly this one is made without the tomatoes. <laughs> It's hard to talk right here because of all the people. But there's not much clams. It smells good. Mm. Even though it's my first time to have this dish, I have to say it was really good. I really tasted the freshness of the clams. And also, it might look creamy, but it's really not. That's just mostly olive oil. You know, aside from the firm texture of the pastas here, the other thing I really noticed about Italian pastas is how simple it is. And because of that, it gave me a deeper understanding and appreciation of Italian pastas. It's really firm, huh? Always. Try the fish. Look at this. We're gonna get the fish in here. 
That is so great. It's like a goldfish. Oh no. This fish is good. Like there's sweetness to it. It's like reddish. Yeah. <clears throat> with this one, where you can see the whole head. I have no idea what kind of fish this is, but it was sweet and flavorful. It's kind of reddish. Oh. I'll get the um. I'll try the. The squid. Let's see if it's like. Uh, perfectly cooked, let's see. It's not chewy. It's not tender. I mean, it is kind of tender. It's so good, the breading's good. Right? It's not too salty, it's not too oily. Man, this place is really good. So far, we, you know, for me, I haven't had anything that I didn't like yet. Everything's good. I'm go with this shrimp. So that dish only has like a squid, that fish, and this squid. I mean this shrimp. Oh man. The cooking just seems better. It just seems better. The flavor is just different because it's a different seafood. Pretty good. Thank you. Thank you. Put some Parmesan cheese on this. Mm. This should bring out the flavor. <laughs> mm. Very good. Put some lemon on it. Can you tell we really like this restaurant? Well, it seems like every food they serve here is either good or really good. So after seeing the Colosseum and the Palatine Hill and many other sites in that area, for the past days we've pretty much explored every major landmarks here in Rome, which is a good thing because we only have one more day here and tomorrow is going to be really interesting. We're going to cover a lot of ground, that means a lot of walking. Not only we're going to eat the best pizza in Rome, at least from what I've read, but also we'll visit some popular spots such as the Baths of Caracalla, Circus Maximus, and a few other notable places. Then after doing all that, we'll probably end our day at this restaurant again, where we're going to have our last and final meal here in Rome. Very soft. Yeah, this fish tastes different from the other one. This one's kind of sweeter. The red one. But it's not bad. This big one has a lot of meat. Hmm. Really interesting. 